Come out of her, my people, live the days of unleavened bread. Living the days of unleavened bread, what does that mean? Come out of her, my people. What are we talking about? Well, greetings. I'm David Brett with John Fisher, bringing you Revealing the Truth. Today we want to talk to you about the days of unleavened bread, which we've just come out of recently. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about the days of unleavened bread, we're talking about an appointed time, a period of time that Yahweh has set apart from the beginning. In Exodus chapter 12, uh, in verse 15 it says, Seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now we know that this is not just for Israel, but for all who would join. And so for the foreigner, uh, in verse tw uh, 49 of chapter 12, it says, The same law shall apply to the native as the stranger who sojourns among you. Now when we go over to the New Testament, we find that this time period is kept. Paul explains this, and he explains what unleavening is. So today we'll want to take a look at uh, some of the things that we are to remember and do, the physical and spiritual aspects we are to consider, and also the good and bad of leavening. There is a couple different ways to look at it. The kingdom life versus the worldly life, and then living the days of unleavened bread rather than doing the wrong we see in the world. In Revelation 18.4 it says, Come out of her, my people. Who, are, who is he talking about? It says, So that you will not share in her sins. Whose sins? Her sins? So that you will not receive of any of her plagues. There are plagues coming? Well, we know that there's tribulation. We know that there is sin in the world. And we know that there's a system in place that has been set up by Satan himself to draw people away from Yahweh, to bring worship to him. And, you know, Yahweh tells us in his word in, in Deuteronomy 12, uh, verse 31, 32 there, for example, it says that we are not to take up the ways of the world and to worship him in the ways that the world worships their deities. Because that's all sat satanic worship. And what have we done? We've taken things out of Babylon. We've taken things out of Egypt. We, we've put them up and said, well, let's baptize these in the name of Christianity and worship the Father in these ways. Yahweh doesn't allow it. So how are we to come out of the world? Well, by not taking up the ways of the world for, for a start. In Exodus 12, we read that seven days we shall eat unleavened bread. That's essentially a command. We are to eat during that time. Now this time comes after the days or after Passover, another appointed time, which is a sacrifice. And we understand that for us today in Messiah, that Yahshua, the Messiah, Yahweh's salvation, He is our Passover lamb. The blood was shed for us so that we may live and have life. And we are to choose. Uh, Yahweh tells us to choose life rather than death, which is what we see in the world, the, the things that produce death, sin, which is contrary to Yahweh's ways. It is basically a disobedience to his laws, his ways, his his statutes, judgments, and, and these type of things. Yeah, that's what leavening represents, is basically uh, disobedience and taking up the ways of the world. The, um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, is about removing the leaven, removing the sin out from our, our lives uh, to clean up, as it were, uh, our lives and come back to Yahweh, to co come back to do His will. Mm -hmm. And there is a, a holy day, a holy convocation at the beginning of the, of the Days of Unleavened Bread, and at the end there is also a closing high holy day, uh, basically a, essentially a Sabbath. 
And for those of you who may observe the seventh day Sabbath, this is referred to as a high Sabbath. And the Jews had a preparation day before this particular high Sabbath. And so when you get into a study of the timing of when Passover was, when the days of unleavened bread were, and when Yahshua kept the Passover um, and ate of that, it was at a different time than what the Jews were, were doing. Uh, we find that uh, there are certain traditions that have come into play that we, we don't want to partake of. But as we go through, we find that there is um, three times in a year that Yahweh requires us to sojourn, to, to go forth. Now, anciently, uh, you know, they would go to the tabernacle. Uh, in the first century, they would go to the temple. In fact, on Pentecost, they were on their way to the temple and they received the Holy Spirit. Well, what if they hadn't have been obedient to Yahweh's word? Would they have received the Holy Spirit? These are th some things to consider. Yahweh expects us to be obedient children, not disobedient. When, it, when we read Exodus 23 and verse 14, it says three times, and the word times there is regal. It, it basically means to foot or to leg a, a journey, essentially. There's another word we can take a look at, which uh, is similar. But it says three times in a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you. At the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. It goes on, it talks about Pentecost, it goes on and talks about the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. In verse 17 it says three times, now the, this, this word times in the Hebrew is different, it's pa'am, and it basically means footstep, hoof beat, uh, a stroke, or uh, steps. Um, essentially meaning you are to sojourn. And when we go over to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 16, we find that there are things that have changed over time. Now, does Yahweh change? Well, Yahweh's character doesn't change. His mercy, His grace, we find mercy and grace from the very beginning. He has given us His Son. We find mercy and grace even now today. We find but in uh, Deuteronomy 16 and verse uh, 5, whereas they kept the Passover before in their house, uh, they are told, and we are told, you are not allowed to sacrifice of the Passover in any of your towns which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. Now this is talking about the land of Canaan, which we know is Israel today. Uh, they were given that land. Uh, Joshua and the Israelites went in. Uh, those over the are under the age of accountability, plus Joshua and Caleb. Yahweh has certain things for us that we need to pay attention to, and it may seem strange to people today. Well, aren't we supposed to keep Easter? And uh, what about Christmas and, and these other days that we worship? What about Sunday? What is, what is Sunday? Well, Yahweh is very specific in His Word. He says, six days you shall work, just like six days, you know, uh, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But uh, when we talk about the Sabbath, we're talking about six days during a work week, and then the seventh day, very specific, the seventh day is the Sabbath unto Yahweh. It's not the Jews' fat, pass, uh, Sabbath, just as the Passover isn't the Jews, it's Yahweh's Passover. You read of this in Leviticus chapter 23, mm -hmm. starting out with the, the weekly Sabbath. And then it says, uh, talks about the Passover days of unleavened bread. He says these are His appointed times. These so, are holy convocations. Oh yeah. There are seven yeah. holy convocations every year, and the Sabbath is the first one given, and then there's seven uh, Sabbaths, high Sabbaths, uh, instead of the Hebrew word Shabbat, is uh, Shabbaton, that are given. They're all about the Messiah. They're all about the, the plan of salvation. That's why they're so important to acknowledge and honor by, uh, by keeping those days. Yeah, and it's not just the males that were to appear. Now, the wording does say, all your males shall appear before Yahweh. But when we take things in context, it's just like, well, saying, well, uh, Yahshua rose in three days. Well, he himself said three days and three nights. But we can look at a, a part of that um, and, and, and recognize the whole. Well, in saying that your men shall appear before me, well, 
ultimately, yes, the, the males, the heads of the households, but that includes the women and the children and the family in general. And you can re reference this yourself in Deuteronomy 31 and verse 12. Also, um, well, let's go over to Deuteronomy, back to Deuteronomy 16 and verse uh, 14, for example. Deuteronomy 16 and 14 says, and you shall rejoice in your feast. You and your son and your daughter and your male female servants the levite the stranger the orphan the widow who are in your towns this was for all of israel and for the strangers for anyone who wanted to join and worship yahweh in the way he wants worship and we're told very plainly laid out in scripture that was observed in the new testament times by the disciples by yahshua by yahshua himself i mean he was there keeping the passover and now we understand that the emblems were implemented and that we have unleavened bread today, but there's meaning behind that unleavened bread. So there's certainly physical aspects that we are to be aware of, uh, and they teach us spiritual lessons. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 13, it says, You shall be blameless before Yahweh your Elohim. Is Yahweh going to give us something that we're not capable of doing? He says, you shall be blameless. After giving the law, after giving his instructions, this is the way you shall walk, walk there in it. Um, you know, ultimately, we see this being fulfilled in the kingdom. But whether in the kingdom or from the beginning, nowhere in between are we told, nah, forget what I said back here. <laughs> And forget about the prophecy that says all these things are going to be done in the future. And forget the New Testament, forget the first century in which the disciples and Yahshua himself were obedient to Yahweh's ways. In fact, Yahshua didn't sin not once, and he set the very example for us. When we go uh, and look at what Paul was teaching in 1 uh, Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse uh, 8, he says, let us keep the feast. What is he talking about? He says in verse... Um, Seven, clean out the old leaven. What? Well, we don't have to do those Old Testament laws, those Mosaic laws. Uh, yes, we do. If we want to be obedient to the Father and learn of His ways and learn of the Messiah and to understand how He was unleavened, how He wasn't uh, you know, puffed up and, and adulterated with the ways of the world. He says, uh, Paul says in verse 7, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, for as in fact you are unleavened, for Messiah our Passover also was sacrificed. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So there is good and bad aspects of leavening, and we'll take a look at uh, some more of this when we come back right after this. Who has ascended into heaven and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name, if thou canst tell? Hello, I'm Carrie Brett with Yahweh's Assembly in Yahshua. Learn more about the importance of the divine names of our Heavenly Father and His Son, as well as getting better insight of the scriptures that will help you to learn biblical truth. Request our free literature, Discovering the Name of Yahshua in the King James Bible, and the Hebrew Aramaic origin of the New Testament. To receive your free literature, visit us online at www.yaiy.org. You can also write to Y-A-I-Y, 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri, 65262. Or call us toll free at 1-877-642-4101. The good and bad of leavening, we'll want to take a look at both. Uh, in fact, in a parable that Yahshua gave a number of them in the section of Matthew 13, we find him talking about the tares and the, and the wheat and, and these type of things and the mustard seed and uh, the, the leaven that was hid in bread, these type of things. It's kind of interesting to consider what's being said here. It appears that there is both good and bad being described. 
uh, speaking in general of the, of the coming kingdom. Uh, but even right now we are to be living this kingdom life. And I think that's what is being expressed here. And in Matthew 13, verse 24, it says, Joshua presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Now, is this what we're going to find in the kingdom? No. We're going to find Satan being moved out of the picture, being taken away and, and held for a thousand year period, we find. But so how do we consider this? Well, if we are to be living the kingdom life even now, and we know what you know what the kingdom life will be like, it will be a lawful society. It will be ruled with a rod of iron. The disobedience we see today will not be allowed. The satanic influence we see in the world and false ways of worship will not be tolerated. But we are learning right now to sow good seed. We are wheat growing up amongst tares. And that's, that's what's being described here. Tares is not a good thing. Tares are not going to be allowed in the kingdom. They're weeds, essentially, is what we're talking about here. Yeah, essentially. So in verse, and if you've had a garden, you know how... <laughs> how bad the weeds can get if they're not uh, dealt with. And when we look in, in future prophecy uh, through parables and as such, we find that the tares are removed first. They're not going to be allowed to come into the kingdom. All sinners will be uh, wiped out from the earth, essentially. In verse uh, 31, he says, uh, it says, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Well, a little mustard seal, seed produces a big plant. And it says, and this, uh, and this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger in the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that it says the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing when we look at Revelation 18 and verse 2. It talks about uh, the end of the age. And that's something that we'll want to consider in these parables. In Revelation 18 and verse 2 it says, And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. When we look at verse 33, it says, He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. Now, when we look at, at pecks, those are our measures. Well, it, there's three measures to an ophar. An ophar uh, was never allowed to be uh, offered with uh, leaven. And so this, this hiding uh, was something deceitful. And, you know, there's other areas of Scripture we could look at. Psalm 40, uh, verses 9 through 10, talks about not hiding righteousness. You know, we're, we're to be a, a light unto the world. We're not to hide righteousness. So this three, this, uh, this hiding the leaven, the leavening is not good here. But leavening could be considered good if it expands and, and uh, it, you know, is presenting something good. And the kingdom will expand. It will have no end. It will expand and continue to grow. And so we, we know there's areas of Scripture that talk about that. Uh, Revelation 2.20, uh, Revelation 17, 1 through 6 are some other Scriptures you could look at. But when we look back in the law, uh, meal offerings, uh, Leviticus 2.11, were not to have leaven. Uh, getting offered an ephah in Judges 6, 18 through 21, but it was without leaven. Uh, Hannah also offered an ephah, 1 Samuel 1, 24, and Ezekiel commanded the same, uh, Ezekiel 45, 24, also 46, 5, 7, and 11. And that is prophecy for the future. So, again, from the beginning, in the future, uh, there's consistency, and we should be consistent in the middle as we are living this kingdom life now, preparing uh, for the kingdom to come, so that we can be a, a spirit beings in that kingdom to help the physical people that will be brought in. And um, there are going to be uh, what is called a remnant. Uh, Yahweh is going to be bring a remnant in to the coming kingdom. Now, leavening is also uh, referred to as just strictly evil in the sense of false doctrines. Uh, Matthew 16 and verse uh, 6, 
And Yahshua said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, what did they do? They made up their own laws. They were legalistic in the sense that they added this and that and covered up Yahweh's law. So we are to be a lawful people, but we're not to be legalistic. And there's a difference. But it says, they began to discuss this among themselves, saying, here in verse 7, he said that because we did not bring any bread, but Yahshua, aware of what they said, you men of little faith, why did you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000, how many large baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? And then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but the teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they had teachings which led people astray. There are teachings in the world that lead people astray. We need to be aware of this. And how, do we, how are we aware of this? We go into the Word and see what true doctrine is and not the dogma of men. We want to eat in the bread of life. We want to uh, live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh, as Matthew 4 4 talks about, as, as it's uh, uh, mentioned in also Luke 4.4, 4, and goes back to Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, which is Scripture, and that's what they had in the New Testament times. These things need to be understood. Uh, when, we, when we do look at uh, Luke, um, for example, a parallel account in the Evangels, it's like four, four men looking at a house. They're all describing the same house, but different perspectives. So it's good to study uh, through all of these. But uh, leaven can also be described as hypocrisy. Uh, under these, in verse 1 of uh, Luke 12, it says, Under these circumstances, after many thousands of people had gathered together, they were stepping on one another. He began saying to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Well, what is that? Well, hypocrisy, a synonym for hypocrisy is duplicity or double-mindedness. Insincere, essentially a liar. Uh, the literal meaning is acting or putting on uh, a show to get gain or a following. Uh, seeking false worship in the sense of false leaders leading as seeking to lift themselves up. What did the Pharisees do? They, they gave long prayers in the... In the uh, in the squares, you know, we, you don't find us praying on this program because we're not going to be here to make a big show of of what uh, you know what our righteousness. We're not to make a show of that, but we are to be righteous, and we are looking into the Word to try to help those that are seeking truth to understand righteousness, so that they may live this lifestyle in their own uh, respectful, it, it, respectful homes. Yeah. It's not that we didn't pray before we were no, we saying did. this. <laughs> um, but I, I, I feel like I need to add something too, because there may sure. be a question that someone might have in their mind about uh, not putting leaven in the bread as an offering. On the Feast of Pentecost, there are two loaves that are to be presented. And they are leavened loaves, and there's two of them. Yes. And that's a subject for another study, but one of them we believe it represents the house of Judah, the other is the house of Israel, before they're brought together, which is another promise, Ezekiel 37 and, and Jeremiah, and essentially all the prophets talk about the, the um, restoring of the house of Israel, all 12 tribes, when the Messiah returns. So, but that's a whole other story, and there's a reason why that particular bread uh, as opposed to all the other offerings, has leaven in it. We are leavened, as it turns out. Well, in the sense that it, we are not perfect. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that does look to a time in which um, we could consider those being brought in, a remnant. Mm -hmm. so it talks about a remnant of Israel. One of the promises is that Yahweh is not going to forsake Israel. No, wait a minute. Don't we hear of dispensationalism, that Yahweh is done with Israel? Well, how does that match up with him saying he's not done with Israel, essentially? That not one kernel will be lost of Israel. 
there's a process that's, that's going on in Ezekiel, was it 37 mm -hmm. or 38, talks about the dry bones mm -hmm. being, you know, given flesh and sinew and, and being brought into the kingdom. What are these things talking about? Uh, Matthew 23 and verse 13, how upset was Yahweh and Yahshua with the Pharisees? He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. He is very upset with them. And he had the right to really judge them in the sense of condemning them. And he told them how it was because he knew their hearts. Now we are to remove leavening from ourselves and we are to remember what Paul said in going back to 1 Corinthians where he is uh, dealing with those at Corinth that had a number of problems. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians probably have the longest list, laundry list, <laughs> dirty laundry, that is dealt with. Everything from adultery to, uh, you know, the false worship, essentially. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, and we're to get those things out of our lives. We're to be unleavened. We are to be sinless. We are to be blameless, like Yahweh tells us to be. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 1 says, it is actually reported there is immorality among you. Immorality is such as the kind that does not even exist among the Gentiles, that someone has his father's wife. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead, so that the one who would have done this, this deed would have been removed from your midst. For I on part, and he goes on. And this person was to be delivered to Satan, to be uh, essentially removed from the body, and hopefully the person would repent so that he ultimately would be saved. So the whole process that we go through, understanding Passover, what that blood does for us, it removes sin from us, but we have to make sure that it doesn't reappear and that we repent of a wrong way of living. So these days of unleavened bread that are mentioned in Leviticus 23 and Exodus 12 and in other areas of Scripture, Therefore, are, are good. We are to live these days of unleavened bread, not only at the appointed time that they're given, but throughout the rest of our lives, so that we may live this kingdom life even now, living the days of unleavened bread, rather than doing the wrong that we see in the world. And so I'll leave you with the scripture that we started out with. It is Revelation 18.4. And this is worth studying on a word-to-word -word basis, finding out what Scripture says about these things. It says, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. We are promised protection, but we have a responsibility to our Heavenly Father and to do His will.